Today, Keith and I are going to assume our familiar roles. Uh, Keith is representing a publicly traded company that is looking to acquire my client, a privately held venture-backed technology company. Now, this afternoon, we're going to focus on the buyer's walk rights, the buyer's ability to terminate and walk away from the deal after the acquisition agreement has been signed and announced, but before the deal is closed. And we're going to focus in particular on the so-called accuracy of representations closing condition. So let's take a look at what you've drafted here, Keith. It basically says that your client is going to be able to walk away from this deal if any of my client's representations and warranties is inaccurate in any material respect when made on the signing date or is inaccurate in any material respect as brought down to the closing date. Do I have that right? Uh, yes, Rick, you do have it right. Do you have a problem with it? <laughs> well, I think I do. It's a very broad and powerful condition that you've drafted here. It takes every single one of the 60 representations that my client is making and turns it into a walk right. And the accuracy of those representations is tested at two distinct points in time, first at the signing date and then again through the operation of the bring down component of this at the closing date. So it's really 120 closing conditions rolled into one. And if any one of those representations is wrong, either on the signing date or is brought down to the closing date, your client can walk away. And we just can't have that. Once this deal gets publicly announced, irreversible things happen to my client. A bell gets rung that can't get unrung. You, you mean you can't put the horse back in the barn? Right. You, 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 can't, you, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. You can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. Uh, I, I get it. I get okay, it. Okay, get the picture. All right. And, and on hearing an acquisition announced, my client's very talented but always insecure employees will flood the street with their resumes. Many will leave. My client's insecure customers, who love my client's products now but don't know what the future holds under new ownership, will delay or even cancel orders outright, sending my client's backlog and revenues into a tailspin. And these employees and customers, they won't come back. If the deal doesn't close, my client will be damaged goods, it will be left flapping in the wind, it'll be game over. As I said, an unmitigated disaster. Look, let's look at it from the buyer's perspective for a second because it's not like my client wants to announce a deal and then have the deal fail. And in any event, we need the right to walk from the deal if my client's not getting what it's bargained for. If my client has bargained to buy a Tesla, it doesn't want to end up owning a Chevy Volt. But, but the problem with your walk right, the way you've drafted it, is, is that it has what I would call a hair trigger. So it's way too easy for unimportant deviations from the reps to trigger a walk right. Come on, Rick. You've got to be practical. Why would my client walk away for an unimportant deviation? It just doesn't make sense. I think your client could have another reason, like buyer's remorse, for wanting to walk and then use a trivial deviation as a pretext for walking. So we just can't give you that whoa, 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 opening. Wait a minute. Your client has protection against trivial breaches. If you look at the language of the condition, I've got four words in all material respects. Each rep need only be accurate in all material respects. So immaterial inaccuracies don't count and can't be used against your client. Well, I got three words for you, and that's not good enough. I want to test this materiality standard that you're proffering here, Keith, with an example. Now, you have a rep in the IP section, and it's a rep that says Schedule 2.12C lists all registered trademarks owned by the target company. Well, let's say my client listed on that schedule four registered trademarks, but it inadvertently overlooked, I don't know, 16 other registered trademarks that it owns. Then before the closing, my client tells your client that 20 trademarks should have been listed on that schedule, not just four. Would you say that rep has been materially breached? Well, of course, I'm not a math major, but the difference between 20 and 4 is a big difference. Yeah, that's material. That's my point, Keith. The rep may be materially inaccurate, 
But should the buyer, should your client even care about that? The target company is not worse off, it's better off. There has to be some concept of the inaccuracy in the rep having a bad effect on the target company before your client should be able to walk away. That's why I'm proposing to reword the accuracy of rep's closing condition. My wording says you can walk away if all the inaccuracies in the target company's reps collectively have a material adverse effect on the buyer. That addresses my problem. So are we good with this new language? Absolutely not. MAE is way too high of a standard. It's going to vitiate my client's walk rate. We both do public company deals. My formulation of this closing condition with the MAE standard, with the material adverse effect standard, is universally included in acquisition agreements where the target company is publicly traded. So if your client can live with this standard when it's buying a public company, why can't it live with the same standard here? Buying a public company is very different than buying a private company, Rick. Public companies have gone through underwriter due diligence. They're subject to internal control standards. They're subject to other standards. It's just a very different animal. Keith, it should actually be easier for you to live with my language in the private company deal. Your client can always take comfort in being able to get indemnified for the breach after the closing. Well, that would be true if we had unlimited indemnity, but you've negotiated a lot of limitations on that, so it's just not as good. Let's look at these M&A studies and see what the statistics say. Let's do that. Here are the stats from the latest ABA target study. It's virtually a 50-50 proposition, and the trend toward using my language, the MAE language, is growing. As someone who represents buyers more than half the time, I'm disturbed by this trend uh, because it means that what's taking place is what we call public company bleed, that the public company trends are bleeding into private company M&A. And deal certainty has become the name of the game, making it very difficult for buyers to walk.